You are here, moving in our midst. We worship you. We worship you. You are here, working in this place. We worship. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. in every heart I worship you I worship you you are here healing every heart I worship you I worship you you are here turn That is who you are. 
Good morning, Renewed. This is our call to worship. A call to worship sets the tone as we begin our time of worship. The leader will read a series of calls, which is me, and in turn, you out there will respond by reading aloud the yellow text. And this is uh, taken from Psalm 23 and 1 John 3, 16 through 24. Day by day, God leads us to the deep, deep pools of peace, to the green, lush lawns of grace. Day by day, Jesus calls us to pour out ourselves in service, to anoint the stranger with hope. Day by day, the Holy Spirit shows us the community we could be, the family we are called to become. Let's continue in worship. where you meet us take me there take me there if what you need is just an offering it's right here my life is here and I'll be a living sacrifice for you to refine a refiner I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord is my life, if your glory wants to come here, let it fall. I wanna be tried by fire. 
Hello and good morning. I am Dave Sim, pastor here at Renew Church in Linwood. So glad you can join us on this Sunday morning. Join us in worship and fellowship and uh, listening to the word, prayer, and hearing scripture uh, read. And uh, if this is your first time and you're a guest, welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad you could join us. Hopefully Renew can be a place uh, where you find home. Um, that can be a home to you. and. Um, find family. If you want to get to know us more, you can head over to our website at renewlinwood.church, renewlinwood.church, and while you're there, fill out a digital connect card um, so that we can be in contact with you. And if you have any prayer requests, feel free to leave them there and I will be praying for you. Um, and we're going to kick off um, our service today with family time. And during family time, we are going to play Family Feud. It's that week again for Family Feud. Um, so the first one is this. We asked a hundred Americans, how much do you tip for good service? How much do you tip for good service? What were the top answers? 30 seconds. <laughs> And the number one answer with 20%, 20 people said, no, no, 39 people said they would tip 20% for good service. Number one answer. Number two answer is 15%. Number three answer is 25%. Number four, 18%. And number five answer is just straight up $20. I'll just give them a $20 bill. All right, that's a good start. That's a good start. Here is our next family feud question. And let me go. Now, 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 now. Name a, fav, a famous wizard. Name a famous wizard. 30 seconds. Ready, break. <laughs> And the list of famous wizards is with 37 votes Harry Potter. Number two answer Merlin. Number three Gandalf. Number four Doctor Strange. Number five The Wizard of Oz. And those are your answers. One more family feud question. I'm not gonna ask that one. Name another word for book. Name another word for book. Ready, break. <laughs> Thank you. 
number one answer with 55 responses is novel. Number two answer, story. Number three answer, paperback. Number four, pamphlet. And number five answer, answer is tome, a tome. Thank you for playing Family Feud. And now we are headed to musical worship. Yeah. 
yes, I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Say hi in the Facebook comments, say your name, who you're worshiping with, where you're worshiping from. And as an icebreaker question, icebreaker question, um, we have this. What is the worst trouble you got, uh, you got into as a kid? What is the worst trouble you got into as a kid? And if you're a kid right now, what is the worst trouble you remember getting into? What is the worst trouble? you got into. Ready? Break. Oh 
Our scripture reading today comes from Acts 19, 1 through 12 in the Common English Bible Version, and I'll read. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took a route through the interior and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you came to believe? They replied, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, what baptism did you receive? Then they answered, John's baptism. Paul explained, John baptized with a baptism by which people showed they were changing their hearts and lives. It was a baptism that told people about the one who was coming after him. This is the one in whom they were to believe. This one is Jesus. After they listened to Paul, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in other languages and prophesying. Altogether, there are about 12 people. Paul went to the synagogue and spoke confidently for the next three months. He interacted with those present and offered convincing arguments concerning the nature of God's kingdom. Some people had closed their minds though. They refused to believe and publicly slandered the way. As a result, Paul left them, took the disciples with him, and continued his daily interaction in Tyrannus's lecture hall. This went on for two years so that everyone living in the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word, Lord's word. God was doing unusual miracles through Paul. Even the small towels and aprons that had touched his skin were taken to the sick, and their diseases were cured, and the evil spirits left them. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word and acts. Uh, thank you for the witness and testimony of Luke and the apostles. Um, and thank you that your Holy Spirit is empowering, empowered the church in the past and continues to empower the church today to be your body, your witness, and your representatives in the world um, in all its diversity, um, in all um, of its giftedness, its, our struggles, our differences. Still, uh, you empower us to do your work. Help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to remind you guys that we are in a series in the book of Acts, and the book of Acts was written by Luke, and is oftentimes is basically the sequel to the Gospel of Luke, so you have Luke and then you have Acts. So many commentators, many experts call Luke and Acts, Luke-Acts, uh, both written by Luke. And many people call Acts the Gospel of the Holy Spirit, the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. You may say, oh, this is Acts of the Apostles, but actually, when we read these stories, when we go through Acts, we see that there's a prime mover, that there is a character that's moving and influencing and empowering uh, the disciples of Jesus Christ and the church as it's forming and then as it's spreading from Jerusalem to Judea to, uh, and beyond. And this is the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, empowering and being, infusing um, its gifts, its, its, its abundance um, to the people of God as the word about Jesus Christ, as the Messiah, the risen Lord, and the one to follow and trust as a new kingdom king in the world and the book of acts we remember began with a bang in chapter two there was a howling wind as the disciples were alone in a room and hiding waiting 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 because jesus before he left into heaven said wait wait for my holy spirit then you will be empowered i will make you disciples to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, so they're waiting, just as Jesus told them, and the curtains began to shake. I don't know if they had curtains. The windows rattled, 
They probably ha didn't have glass windows either. Right? The doors banged, flew open, and there was a howling wind and flames, individual flames, right? Crackling, burning, hot flames landed on the heads, above the heads of each of the pe per persons there. And the people outside hearing the commotion, hearing the sound of what was like a hurricane, a storm, gathered around this house where the disciples had been gathered to see what was going on. And then the apostles, the disciples began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, began to teach the scriptures. And the people who had gathered began to understand in their mother tongue. The disciples didn't know these languages, but the Spirit of the Holy Spirit had infused them to speak the word with confidence. The Holy Spirit had empowered the people to be able to understand in their own mother tongue. A miracle had happened, and this is how the church was birthed. You know, I grew up in the church for most of my life, being a PK, a pastor's kid, um, going to church every day. It seemed like every day for all of my life. And I've always struggled. I've always struggled. There's always been a tension in me between uh, relying on, or between the Holy Spirit and being empowered and, you know, being, uh, being structured and planning things out and being well prepared. And what, what was the faithful thing to do? Let me, let me fill that out more. You know, sometimes uh, you may hear people say, oh, just don't, don't work too hard. Don't practice. Don't plan. Just go with the Spirit, right? Don't, like, just allow the Spirit to move in you. But sometimes when people say that, I think that just means it's another word for just procrastinate. It's like all the lazy procrastinators say, just go with the Spirit. As if doing nothing means you're allowing the Spirit to move. On the one hand, yes. I think when we let go and let God, it allows the Spirit to move and do something. We get out of the way of the Spirit. But sometimes we use that as a cop-out. Or, and that's the tension. We say, oh, I just want to go with the Spirit. But that just, that's just an excuse for being lazy and disorganized. On the flip side of that, we have your planners, your strategists, right? Being orderly, being organized is godliness. And you would say to that person, just let the Spirit move and say, no. God wants us to plan things out and work things so that the Spirit can move. Right? I, I plan, right, and I think and I prepare in order that the Spirit can move through me. Right? So there's this tension, right? Is, is empowerment, is the power of God experienced just by this kind of receiving the, this wind, right? This fire that just does it for you. Even though you don't have anything planned, even though it's not as you, you expected, it's just surprises everyone in the room. God blows up everything that we planned, everything that we imagined, right? Does the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, just mean being spontaneous? So those who are uh, spontaneous personalities have a monopoly on being Spirit-led? Or does being Spirit-led and empowered of Spirit mean, right, Having the means and the gifts and the ability to think and plan and structure things, right? To create spaces where God can move, where God can position people to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. This tension between how much do I do in God's plan and work and how much am I just letting go? and letting God take the reins. It's a real tension. So I want us to think about that as we think about the passage that I just read. But first, I kind of want to go back 
uh, to chapter 18 because we skipped a section in chapter 18 to move on to chapter 19. But I wanted to remind us previously in Acts, we remember from last week, Paul was in Corinth, right? In his latest stop as the itinerant apostle, the itinerant minister, continuing to proclaim Jesus Christ as Messiah in the synagogues and also in the streets to both Jews and Gentiles. Paul and his message were lightning rods, right? He was a lightning rod, drawing in people who were receiving and accepting. They were accepting and having trans transformative experiences by giving their lives to Jesus Christ, Jesus, and believing that Jesus was Messiah. So from acceptance to the flip extreme, those who would hear and yet not believe and even had violent responses, rejected and abused Paul. So both persecution and acceptance. Perse either he was persecuted or he was accepted and welcomed and had a good response. And we know in chapter 18, as we discussed last week, that Paul was weary. I think he was very tired and discouraged. Any of us would be, right? If we were perpetually on the road, going from town to town, going to strange places, relying on the hospitality of strangers, and not always being welcomed in this new and strange place. And in fact, having people throw insults at you or physically try to harm you, it would not be fun. It would be tiring. It would be scary. And it would be discouraging, right? And remember in chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, Paul has a vision, one that encourages him and emboldens him. 18.9, one night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, don't be afraid. Continue speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you and no one who attacks you will harm you for I have many people in the city. So he stayed there for 18 months, teaching God's word among them. And we hold, as we read these words, we hold on to the familiar words in the Bible. Don't be afraid. Written so many times, spoken so many times throughout the scriptures. And I am with you. Don't be afraid. I am with you. In our own lives, when we are weary, tired, discouraged, tempted to quit or walk away, God's promises are still strong, are still reliable, are still there to deliver us. He's got your back, right? And verse 11 reads, so, so, because of these words that God spoke, so Paul stayed for another 18 months in Corinth. And it's also beautiful to note here that God promises no harm to Paul, for I have many other people in the city. And the rest of chapter 18, church, tells us about the friends that Paul makes, the partners that God provides, the community, the family that God provides, you know, to deliver on his promise that I have many people here and no harm will come to you. God surrounds Paul with community. So much so that verse 18 in chapter 18 reads that after Paul was in Corinth for a while, for some time, he then decided it was time to move on and so he said goodbye to all his brothers and sisters. He has a farewell, right? He goes from maybe this lone ranger going from city to city, being chased from city to city. Yes, he has partners here and there to having brothers and sisters, the scripture says. And on top of this, Priscilla and Aquila, 
You remember the couple whose names rhyme? The tent makers who he stayed with? Depart from Corinth with Paul as his travel companions and partners in ministry. This is awesome, amen? Awesome. And so from here in chapter 18, Paul goes from place to place, retracing his steps and it says, the scripture says, strengthening the disciples. He's going, he goes back, um, all the way back to Jerusalem and to Antioch even, um, strengthening the disciples. It's like he's this traveling cars, car repairman, tuning up the cars as he goes. Instead of us, oh, I need an oil change. I'm gonna drive to Jiffy Lube. Instead of us driving to Jiffy Lube to get the car tuned up, right? What if the oil change people came to your house and tuned your car up? And that's the image I get of Paul going from place to place to place to place, retracing his steps to all of the churches he started, all of the communities of faith that were blossoming because of his initial influence. He's going back and strengthening disciples, right? Oh, tuning, up, tuning them up. Oh, you need a little correction here. Oh, you need some encouragement here. Oh, you're feeling tired and weary and discouraged? Let me tell you about my own experience and God, how God met me in his promises. Amen. So Paul is mentoring and strengthening the disciples. And at the end of chapter 18, we're also introduced to a new disciple, Apollos. He's from Alexandria. He kind of shows up out of nowhere. No one like trained him or recruited him that we know of. But he's a young disciple who was well educated from Alexandria and knew the Christian teachings very well. He spoke with confidence in the synagogue in Ephesus. And Priscilla and Aquila, right, they notice him and they're like, wow. There's a talented, gifted young man, much like Paul, because he's arguing and winning his arguments in the synagogue for the sake of Jesus Christ, right? The guy has skills, the guy has potential, right? And passion, but they also see the rawness in him. He's knowledgeable, he's passionate, he's like a mini Paul, but the scripture says that they take him into their circle of friends and instruct him more accurately in the teachings of Jesus. Let us tune you up, right? Let us strengthen you as a disciple. Let us instruct you, right, more accurately in the way of Jesus Christ. Also, to one to note is they take him into their circle of friends. So once again, like Paul, we have the steam of the minister, of the person, the follower of Jesus Christ, being surrounded by community, needing family, needing a circle of friends. And then secondly, this idea of the disciple of Christ, the follower of Jesus, needing to be instructed, needing to have continual strengthening. In the case of Apollos, correction, right? To teach him more accurately in the way of Jesus Christ. Community and growth and teaching and instruction. Community and instruction. So there's a very intentional uh, process here of community building, accountability, and disciple making and teaching. And Paul has a very kind of structured strategy in how he's starting and planting churches and communities of faith, but then retracing and going back to strengthen um, the leaders in those places, um, to light a fire once again, to give a boost of confidence, to empower, to be a catalyst. So this is where we come to chapter 19. Apollos is now in Corinth and Paul has circled back to Ephesus, so, um, and while Apollos is in Corinth, Paul goes to Ephesus and he finds some disciples in Ephesus. We learned earlier that Priscilla and Aquila 
and Apollos were in, were in um, Ephesus before Paul arrives there here. And so no doubt through their influence, through their ministry and pro proclamation in the synagogues, um, that this is why Paul discovers that there's disciples there. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you came to believe? And they had not even heard of the Holy Spirit. They're like, Holy Spirit? What's the Holy Spirit? Then he said, what baptism did you receive then? This is an interesting question. And they answered John's baptism. You remember John, John the Baptist, the one who was to Jesus' cousin, to came to prepare the way for the Messiah and baptized Jesus. And basically they came into the knowledge of God and faith as disciples through John's baptism, through John's ministry. And Paul has to, again, we see this idea of correction or filling out their instruction in the way of the gospel in Jesus Christ, right? You guys are on the right path. John's baptism was about repentance. Like general, in general, is about turning your life around and going away from death and into life. But let me tell you about Jesus, right? You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus because John was merely the person pointing the way to Jesus. Hey, stop, turn around. Let me tell you about Jesus. That was John's ministry. But you need to walk further and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because he is the end boss, right? He's the, he's the boss at the end. Jesus is. So they Paul baptizes them in the name of the Lord Jesus. They receive his word. And as Paul is placing his hands on them, the Holy Spirit comes down and they begin speaking in tongues and other languages and prophesying. And an interesting note is, and altogether there's about 12 people. Hey, let, you know, kind of like the 12 disciples, right? Here's this other church in Ephesus and these 12 people are being baptized in Jesus Christ. And on top of that, the Holy Spirit is coming upon them and baptizing them. And this is where I want to kind of lean into and push into this idea of what does it mean to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to go with the power of God, to experience the power of God and allow God's power to move in our lives? Because this passage, you know, different churches have approached this passage in different ways, right? You could have a church, you know, one tradition say, oh, so when you become a G baptized in Jesus, when you become a disciple of Jesus, when you become a Christian, you will become baptized in the Holy Spirit. So being baptized in the Holy Spirit must be a, like a, a necessity. Like it, it's, a, it's something that comes out of following Jesus. So every believer, true believer, should be baptized in the Spirit. Other people will point to other things. It's like the baptism in Jesus Christ comes first, right? right? You, Jesus is the main thing, receiving Jesus. And whether you're baptized by the Holy Spirit or not, that's, you know, there's no blueprint for that. In other parts in Acts, the Holy Spirit comes in a different order before baptism, after baptism, by water, whatever. We don't know. But this whole idea in Acts, this tension that I mentioned before between structure and order and tradition and the Holy Spirit moving organically and empowering and moving out and taking new frontiers. That what's going on in Acts, I think, is not an either or, right? Like, here is the Church of Jerusalem, right? The tradition, the established, the ordered. And here is the Holy Spirit saying, forget you, Antioch, to the ends of the earth, to Greece, to Rome. 
right? And undermining the established structure. But what you have is this interplay, right? This interplay of strategy, right? Paul was very intentional in this ministry. Paul was very intentional about going from town to town, very strategic in going to the synagogues of those towns and those cities, and then going into the places where there were great thinkers and influencers and philosophers and arguing for Jesus, powerfully and confidently for the gospel and for Jesus as the Messiah, right? And then going and discipling, you know, going back and strengthening the disciples. These are very intentional, organized things. We go all the way to the beginning of Acts. That tension still exists, right? What's the first thing that the disciples, after Jesus leaves, what do they do? They're like, we need to replace Judas. So they select Matthias, right? We need 12. There's something about Jesus' 12 disciples. We need 12. But then how do they decide it? They draw lots, right? It's just, what? Right? And then you have the Pentecost, this, this kind of wild, like explosive in, inbreaking of the Holy Spirit. And yet, also, as the community of faith is being formed, right? Acts 6, we see that, you know, conflict arises. So, they're, you know, they need to start organizing and delegating to greet to the Greek leaders um, as it pertains to the distribution of food, right? There's a sign of administration and order, right? Also, even though Paul was called to the Gentiles and like there's all this amazing new stuff happening in Antioch he still returns to Jerusalem to get their blessing and Jerusalem writes a letter back to Antioch just make sure you do this and you do this right and still the Holy Spirit continues to press forward still these amazing things are happening so while Paul is intentional and strategic and very gifted in his leadership and recruiting leaders and empowering leaders. Also, what you have going on here is, man, the, the let go and let God stuff, right? The spontaneous stuff. Like, here are these random people in Ephesus. Let's just get baptized. And he lays his hands on them and the Holy Spirit just comes upon them. Right? They start speaking in other languages and they're prophesying out of control. Maybe there are dogs barking, animals barking, I don't know. But this detail of, and altogether there are about 12 people, right? And it ends with this image, our, our section ends with this image of God was doing unusual miracles through Paul. Even the small towels and aprons that had touched his skins were taken to the sick and their diseases were cured and the evil spirits left them. You know, one of the fastest growing churches in the entire world, the global world, right? Is the Pentecostal church, the charismatic church. Right, global Pentecostalism is exploding, right, in the developing world. And, you know, I hear stories from missionaries or my friends from other countries uh, who talk about, right, all of these healings or this, this revival where thousands of people became Christians, right, and all these miracles, even about people being raised from the dead, resurrected, or people who are lame, actually being physically healed. And I'm like, this is crazy. That's, cr I don't even believe you. It's incredulous. Like, why does it seem like all these powerful, very vivid, unusual miracles of the Holy Spirit is happening in these other places across the world? And here in the US, it's just like, man, like, Maybe I've led one or two people to Christ, 
in the last 10 years? Like, what's going on? Like, how many people are being baptized through the ministry of Renew? And I'm like, how many healings have I witnessed? And so there's that tension again, like, man, the Holy Spirit of God does crazy, unusual miracles. We see it here in Acts with Paul. At the same time, we're also pulling out all of these leadership principles and church, you know, administrative principles and organizational principles out of the very intentional ministry of Paul and the other apostles. Right? Order and structure. Which is it? Let go and let God? Oh, just let it flow. Be led by the Spirit. Or, oh, you know, get your ducks in the order. Right? And be intentional in what you do. And God will move through that. And I say to you, church, both and, not either or. We tend to talk about either or. Like it's either this or that. It can't be both. But both and. It's that tension in Acts of unusual power and empowerment. Right? And yet, very intentional growth and organization of the church. Right? And the question is, what does it mean for us it means that, you know, we're human and we're finite. Even our most, like, our strongest efforts, our hardest work, is not even a pinprick when it comes to, right, at the end of it all, in the story of God, right, in the kingdom of heaven. Right? It's just a, a little pinprick. Our, our, our life, my life's work is just a pinprick. And at the same time, my life's work is meaningful and makes a difference. Right? And God at any time, when you're lonely and have no one, can raise up for you a whole family and community like he did for Paul. And Apollos, right? The sick can be healed, right? People can come to the faith left and right in the droves. If the Holy Spirit moves, Jesus said, if you had a faith, even as big as a mustard seed, you could say to that mountain, move, and it would move. We need to be ready for the Spirit of God to move powerfully like a humongous wave that we have no control over that'll just sweep over everything and blow us away. And our job is to ride that wave. It's to not fight that wave because if you fight a wave, you're going to be swallowing salty water, right? But if you ride it, you can surf it and just be like, man, God is doing amazing things among us today. Very unusual miracles. At the same time, we don't just sit like couch spiritual couch potatoes and go, oh, the lazier I am, the more the Holy Spirit moves. No. We take the gifts and the talents and the abilities of time and we offer them up to God. He calls us and we serve and we give. And he uses that, every sweat, the sweat and tears, they matter, they make a difference. And that's being empowered by the Holy Spirit. So let us be keen and sensitive and aware to the work and empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the gospel good news of the Holy Spirit in our lives. However that may look, be faithful be faithful, be faithful.
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence. My Savior You call me out upon the water The great
Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that even in the mess of it all, for me personally, a busy week, a full week, yet your spirit moves and does amazing things in the hearts of people and continues to work in spite of us. And yet you use us. You call us to be faithful and you call us you know, to do things well with excellence. Help us to walk in that tension and become artists of your spirit as a community of faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.